Alright, I need your full concentration on this one, because we will be looking at DNS exfiltration, a stealthy web attack you probably didn't encounter before, or maybe you did but didn't pay full attention to it. Anyways, clone the lab from the description below and navigate to the lab directory, then run docker build t and give it any tag name and a period to refer to the current working directory that contains the docker file. If you encountered any problems while building the lab, try running the same command with dash dash no cache flag to install all dependencies from scratch. After the build is complete, run the lab with docker run dash p to bind the port inside the container with the host. Then dash name and give the container any name, then type the image name and finally make sure you add the net admin capability to enable IB tables inside the container so that we can simulate a firewall functionality. Once the container starts, navigate to the address shown here in your browser. Alright, here we have a simple service that checks the status of a website, whether it's up or down. For example, if we type google.com, we can see that it's up and running, and the same goes for other popular domains. And it returns down if we supply a domain or a service that doesn't exist. It also returns bad input if we give it any input that is not in a domain form. After some analysis and fuzzing, this parameter seems to be vulnerable to command injection. For example, when we inject a sleep command for 5 seconds, we can see that it's executed successfully. But that's literally it, you can't do anything else. If you try to execute other commands like OMI or ID, you won't get anything back. The reason for that is because there is a firewall in place that blocks all the suspicious output for any shell command. But maybe we can spin a server on our host and have the vulnerable server exfiltrate the output of any command we execute. Let's try this. Let's run a simple HTTP server using Python and make a HTTP request using curl to our server. By the way, I'm hitting Ctrl plus U to URL encode the payload. When running this payload, we still don't get a call back to our server. Let's try something else. Let's try, for example, to get a reverse shell. Let's set our netcal listener and send a reverse shell. But still nothing. So that's it. A dead end. You can't do anything else. Actually, yeah, that's it. You can't do anything else. I'm sorry. See you in the next one. Just kidding. We're still in the middle of the video after all, right? At this point, most of the bug bounty folks give up and just report a vulnerability and call it a day. If they're lucky, the report will be closed with a medium severity and the vulnerability will be patched. So can we maximize the impact here? Yes, but we need to get clever. First, let's understand why all of our connections to our server are getting dropped or ignored. What's happening here is that when we send a HTTP request to the vulnerable server, we expect a callback or response from it, but that doesn't happen because there's a WAF or a web application firewall in place that blocks all the outgoing TCP connections because there's no service running internally that's supposed to connect to the outer internet. If there are any, the WAF will be configured to only allow TCP connections for these services through specific ports that are whitelisted. But what about UDP connections? Are they blocked too? 90% of the time WAFs allow ingoing and outgoing UDP traffic because most of the time nothing is suspicious about it. DNS or domain name system is a protocol that happens to be based on UDP. For those who don't know what DNS is or how it works, here's a quick explanation for it. Whenever you visit for example google.com in your browser, your computer or your router makes a DNS query to your closest DNS server. The DNS server returns the IP address that results to the google.com hostname. And after your browser receives this IP address, it will use it to navigate to google.com. By the way, this clip is part of a video in which we exploited and bypassed a SSRF protection using DNS rebinding, so check that out if you did. Now we need a DNS server or out-of-band utility to receive DNS queries on. If you have Burp's free bro, you can use the Burp collaborator tool to receive out-of-band interactions. But since most people and beginners don't have Burp's free license, 
we will use Interact SH, an awesome tool from Project Discovery. In order to install this tool, you need first to install Golang because it's written in Go. Install Golang by running app get install Golang, or you can get the binary from the official Golang website. Just run these two commands. After that, install Interact SH with this command. Once it's done, run Interact SH client to start a listener. If you had issues with the installation, clone the whole repository and go to this path, then run go run main.go. Once it runs, it will give you a unique domain to test with. Let's test this domain using the dig command. Here we can see that we received a DNS query with a record type A from my IP address, which is blurred out. But how is this supposed to help us? Well, when a client queries a DNS server, for example, this subdomain, what actually happens is that the DNS server only takes the domain and the top level domain and returns the IP address that corresponds to this domain. And then it logs the domain along with whatever subdomain it's associated with. We can take advantage of this behavior and have the vulnerable server exfiltrate the output of the HOMI command, for example, and prepend it as a subdomain. Let's see this in action. Here we run the dig command like we did before and then inside the parentheses with a dollar sign we put the command which we want to execute and then a period and the domain given to us by the interact sh tool. URL encode then send. And in the logs we can see that the command executed successfully and this is the output of the home I command. So far so good, but I'm still not satisfied. I want to take this to the next level and completely maximize the impact. How about we exfiltrate a whole file or a document? But first, there are some constraints that we need to understand. Each element of a domain name separated by a period is called a label. The maximum length of each label is 63 characters, and a full domain name can have a maximum of 253 characters. Alphanumeric characters and hyphens can be used in labels. Labels here include subdomains or the domain name or the top level domain. Each of these elements can have a maximum length of 63 characters and the whole domain can have a maximum length of 253 characters. Also only alphanumeric characters and hyphens are allowed, which means we can use something like a dollar sign or a at sign, but there's 99.9% .9 chance any file that we want to exfiltrate will have special characters in it. So how do we do that? I will give you 10 seconds to figure this out. If your answer is encoding, then you got it right. If it's something else that you think it might work too, please let me know in the comments down below. Let's say for proof of concept, we will exfiltrate the etc. password file. This file has a lot of special characters which will test the efficiency of this attack. So here's what we're going to do. We will take this file and base64 encode it. Then we will encode it once again with base58. Because the base64 encoding algorithm has three special characters. That's why we will apply base58 encoding on the top of it. Because base58 encoding algorithm has no special characters associated with it. After that we will take all this blob and split it into multiple chunks. Each chunk will have a length of 60, because remember, the maximum length for a subdomain is 63. We're just going to split by 60 because, as Albert Einstein said, the best number is any number that is round to that nearest town. Then we prepend these chunks as subdomains to our domain name, and then we send them all. Once we receive all the interactions or the queries on our DNS server, we will first remove all the duplicate queries like what happened here and carve out the subdomains and concatenate them together, then base58 and base64 decode them and get back our exfiltrated file. Pretty clever, right? Now let's see all of this in code. We're going to have multiple POCs written in both Pash and Python, and I'll tell you why in a second. First, we start with the Pash script. Here we define a variable that stores the first argument, which will be the name of the file that we want to exfiltrate. And then we get the contents of this file and base64 encode. The dash w0 flag here to remove all new lines. Then we base58 encode it. After that, we run the same previous command and pipe it to wc-c 
and then oak to get the length of the encoded blob. Then we define a variable to store the second argument, which will be the domain that is given to us by the interact sh tool. Then we loop through the whole blob and split it into chunks or substrings, which will be 60 characters long. Then we concatenate the chunk and the domain and pass them to the dig command. Then we get the next chunk and so on until we send the whole blob. Before we run the script, let's first log all the DNS queries that we will receive to our file called logs.txt. Now we base64 encode our script and then in burp, we echo the encoded script and pipe it to base64-d to decode it and save it in the temp directory and let's name it pwn.sh. Then we make the script executable with chmod plus x and the full path to the script. And finally, we execute the script with the etc. password file as the first argument, then the domain name. And now we send and wait. After we save all the DNS interactions, we can see that all of them are logged in the logs.txt file that we created. So from here we can carve out the payloads and decode them. But before we do that, let's add some more constraints. What if we don't have the base58 binary on the vulnerable server? Does that mean it's game over for us? In that case, we have to use another approach, which is to create the same script, but this time with Python. In this script, we import base64 and base58 for encoding, socket to make DNS queries and sys to pass arguments to the script. We first check the number of arguments passed if they equal to 3, we pass them to the main function. If not, we print the correct usage for this script. In the main function, we open a handle to the file that we want to exfiltrate. Then we read all of its contents, and then we base64 and base58 encode it. Then we loop through the whole blob and split it into chunks. Each one is 60 characters long, like we did in the bash script. And then we concatenate the chunk and the domain, and then we send a query. And after we exit the loop, we send the remaining characters and close the handle to the file. Now we base64 encode the script and do the same thing we did with the bash script in burp and wait for the queries to return. First, make sure to restart interact sh and get a fresh domain. Sweet. Now let's carve out the logs and extract our exfiltrated file. In this Python script, we call the main function and pass to it the logs file and our unique domain. This regex here to only carve out the payload from the whole domain name. And then we remove any duplicate payloads and then we join them together in one string. Then we base 58 and base 64 decode them. Then we decode any new lines to actual new lines. And then we create a new file called decodedpayload.txt and save the output into it. And finally, we close the handles. The script name, the logs file, and our domain name. And now, when we run it and cut out the output file, we can see our beloved etc. password file. Like the planet! Now let's add even more constraints. What if we don't have neither base64 nor base58 modules installed? In that case, we will have to implement the whole base64 encoding algorithm from scratch. Or we won't have to use base58 encoding for this one. But what about the special characters in the base64 encoding algorithm? The special characters in the base64 encoding algorithm are the plus sign, the equal sign, and forward slash. What we're going to do to sort this issue out is to loop through the whole encoded blob and replace each special character to what corresponds to it in the SQL representation. For example, we will replace the plus sign with the word plus sign, and we use a mix of upper and lower case letters to randomize the data and avoid collisions. So in this Python script, we have only two imports, socket and sys, and this is the implementation of the base64 encoding algorithm. I'm not going to explain the algorithm because it's out of the scope of this video. All what you need to know is that it runs the same way as the base64 module. So in the main function, we read the file that we want to exfiltrate and then we instantiate the base64 class and then we base64 encode the contents of the file. Then we replace each special character to what corresponds to it in ASCII. 
and do the same exact thing we did in the previous script. Now we base64 encode the script and run it in burp, but this time let's exfiltrate the etc shadow file. And as always, we wait for the queries or the interactions to reach our DNS server. Once we receive all queries, we pass the logs file to this Python script, which extracts the payloads and restores the special characters to its correct positions in the blob. And then we base64 decode it and save it to disk. And now when we execute this script, we can see the contents of the etc shadow file. And by the way, this is how I exploited this vulnerability when I was in the engagement. And this is how you should do it too. If you really want to get better at hacking, you have to get clever and think outside the box and do your own research. So I really recommend that you go ahead and clone the lab and practice by yourself and write your own POCs. And always remember that practice makes perfect. Overall, I think this attack was perfect. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. That was the video. Make sure to support us by sharing this video with your friends and whoever is interested in such content. Make sure to spread this video everywhere on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, Discord, and all the possible social media platforms. And also almost 85% of you guys aren't subscribed. So please make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Because this kind of videos takes forever to create. And I do everything from creating the lab, coding the POCs, testing, and more testing, and even more testing. I literally spend like 10 consecutive hours debugging the lab to make sure it's bug free. I then create the simple animation you saw in the video, and finally editing which takes forever to finish. So just for the sake of this effort, make sure to subscribe and tell your friends about us. And also make sure to check out our Patreon and become a Patreon if you can. That's it. I'm out. See you in the next one. Peace.